On behalf of the Associated Student Speakers Program at the University of California at Los Angeles, it is indeed an honor and privilege to have with us today two distinguished men who will be debating the timely and controversial topic resolved that the current path of civil rights is wrong. Our first guest is Mr. William Buckley, Jr., who will be speaking in favor of the resolution. Mr. Buckley is recognized as an articulate spokesman for a conservative philosophy, and he has lectured throughout the nation. At present, he is editor of the National Review magazine, and he also writes a syndicated column. Mr. Buckley's opponent is the well-known Mr. Louis Lomax. Mr. Lomax is internationally recognized as a leading spokesman in the struggle for racial equality among all men. He is involved directly with the social, cultural, and economic problems of America's Negro population. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present our first speaker today, Mr. William Buckley, Jr. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'd like to hope that's real applause, not some sound effect provided by the television. Occurred, but <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lomax, I, I am, uh, I must confess, a terribly reluctant to discuss the, the civil rights question under adversary uh, circumstances uh, for reasons I think that are understandable uh, to you, or in any case ought to be, uh, so great uh, is the sense of duty uh, and uh, 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 of duty of historical and present duty owed by the white people uh, to the colored people uh, that to, to uh, uh, discuss <coughs> some of the finer points uh, that are raised in the so-called civil rights controversy sometimes seems uh, almost uh, uh, obscene, uh, uh, so almost uh, uh, flippant rather like discussing different methods of artificial respiration uh, after the Hiroshima bomb uh, uh, has fallen. And in any case, <coughs> in any case, I must confess that <coughs> I also regret discussing uh, the matter before a mass audience uh, in which theatrical currents are inevitably generated, uh, which tend to encourage uh, polarities and, and short-circuit uh, distinctions. But that is what was desired, and here we are. <clears throat> After the experience of a few nights ago, uh, when Mr. Lomax was brandishing pictures of dead Negro GIs in South Vietnam, uh, and I was lost in gloom as I fingered our Orwellian future, <coughs> I, I, <coughs> I resolved to, to set down very exactly uh, in my preliminary remarks at our encounter here at UCLA, uh, a certain number of, of points so as to make absolutely certain that in the general excitement I do not fail at least to touch on some of the points uh, which in my judgment need most to be touched on. After Mr. Lomax has spoken and it is my turn to reply, I shall rejoin you in making this a swinging affair. <laughs> And, and do what I can to play Simon Legree to Mr. Lomax's passion play. <laughs> uh, uh, until then, permit me to attempt a few uh, propositions uh, ascetically uh, stated. Uh, proposition one, the meaning of the truism uh, that we owe a historical debt to the Negro people is primarily moral rather than programmatic. Uh, I mean by that that we cannot on the one hand deny the historical fact of exploitation, or nor we, can we deny uh, that today there exists a subtle and demoralizing discrimination. 
uh, against Negro people by many, if not even most, uh, of white people. But what is to be done uh, about it uh, is a matter that doesn't very neatly relate to the fact of the historical uh, uh, guilt. Uh, how are we, in fact, going to eliminate, or at least alleviate, uh, this discrimination uh, is something which cannot be answered by mere abstract appeals to the historical debt uh, of the white people. For one reason, for one thing, uh, the doctrine of collective guilt uh, is morally uh, insecure because there are persons who did not contribute to that guilt. And for another, it is counter to Western precepts to engage or to tolerate or to encourage uh, general societal acts of retroactive vindictiveness uh, uh, as witness our enlightened attitude towards Japan and Germany after the Second War in contrast with the bitter failures of our post-World War I policies. A proposition two, <coughs> the ordeal of the Negro people in America must be viewed historically not because we seek thereby to assuage our sense of guilt, but because history is a part of the human experience from which we necessarily learn something about the limitations of efficacious uh, political action. It was the Negro, <coughs> it was Negro tribe masters uh, and Negro slave masters who sold the Negroes uh, as slaves to the white traders. Uh, and the great intellectual and moral agony of conscience which caused a civil war and which causes now in right-minded men a determination to bring about uh, a true equality is primarily the result of a metaphysics of morality bedded deeply in the Christian consciousness, in that same Christian consciousness which James Baldwin has imprudently urged upon us uh, to uh, uh, forego. The slavery uh, of the black man is only an instant of time in the, in the history of human servitude. Uh, and it becomes not a matter of self-serving <coughs> cynicism uh, to point out uh, that in spite of the worst elements uh, of the white people, progress has been made uh, and that much of that progress has been contributed to by precisely the agitation uh, of white people. Uh, Booker T. Washington uh, is, very much, uh, is very much disdained uh, at the present historical moment. He is thought of as a fixture in the age of acquiescence. Uh, but it is correct uh, to consult his words if only because they had meaning to him. Uh, a man who uh, understood something of the evolutionary problem. Uh, and he said, addressing a vast Negro uh, audience uh, in Tuskegee, we went into slavery pagans, we came out Christians, we went into slavery pieces of property, we came out American citizens, we went into slavery without a language, we came out speaking the proud Anglo-Saxon tongue, we went into slavery with slave chains clanking about our wrists. We came out with the beginnings of the uh, American ballot in our hands. It is significant that he said it because he recognized that however slow the fight is, our progress is in fact being made, which raises the question of whether or not the history of the world suggests that progress is mostly accomplished by organic rather than by revolutionary growth. Uh, as a prudential matter, exorbitant demands of some spokesman for the civil rights movement will result, I fear, in a hardening resistance. As a philosophical matter, no aggrieved minority has the right to overturn the mores of a society against that society's consent, provided those mores are not institutionally uh, aimed at the exploitation of that minority. Uh, proposition three, <clears throat> beyond a certain point, the discovery of fresh human rights requires the discovery of corresponding obligations 
Uh, those rights that are incontestably such are those that can be enjoyed without impinging upon the rights of others. A man's right to free speech can be exercised without the obligation of others to hear. Uh, a right to acquire property can be exercised without the duty of others to remit property. The right to practice one's own religion can be exercised without the duty of others to finance that religion or themselves to participate in it. But at a certain point, one moves over the line. And at that point, the presumption is against the right existing as a, quote, right. It becomes something else, a convention, if you like, or an insurance scheme or whatever. But properly, it is not a, quote, right. The Human Rights Declaration of the United Nations is a travesty of human rights. Uh, as, for instance, their discovery of the so-called right of every man to a job of his own choosing. Some of the rights recently discovered by civil rights leaders and by others were never acknowledged or as such in the theoretical litera literature of freedom uh, and were not claimed as rights by other minorities who themselves successfully scaled the ladder on coming to America. But by definition, then, the rights that need special protection are those for whose exercise we have little sympathy. But the law is a restraining instrument designed to protect those who exercise rights which are frowned upon by the majority. Otherwise, uh, such laws would not be necessary. Proposition 4, the doctrine of civil disobedience is not grounded in Christian doctrine nor in the doctrine of human freedom. Uh, Christianity, <coughs> as for instance St. Paul, St. Augustine, uh, and others have confirmed, uh, <coughs> uh, is, represents an obligation of the city to the laws of the community and to the laws of God. The exact line uh, is elusive. But it is not a responsible doctrine that the individual can draw that line for himself. And under the circumstances, some of the asseverations on the subject by Martin Luther King are, are, are infinitely dangerous and infinitely ex explosive. And my final uh, proposition, the civil rights movement is stalled in the protest phase well, let me say, let me say, or rather, or omitting that proposition because of a shortage of time, that the, as a final proposition, the civil rights movement uh, is in danger of becoming a Weltanschau, or uh, a worldview which the majority of the American people, whether white or black, have thus far re rejected, but which both whites and Negroes find it difficult to face down, precisely because of the sublime rhetoric in which it is so often clothed. The deep rumbling of discontent, says Dr. King in one of his typical diapasons, that we hear today is the thunder of disinherited masses rising from dungeons of oppression to the bright hills of freedom. In one majestic chorus, the rising masses singing in the words of our freedom song, ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. <laughs> All over the world, like a fever, uh, the freedom movement is spreading in the widest liberation in history. Now, in the first place, this simply isn't so. Uh, the, rising, the rising masses in the principally oppressed nations of the world, if they sing at all, uh, do so in concentration camps. And it is not a part of Dr. King's rhetoric to go to their rescue. Uh, the rising masses in Africa have risen from colonial despotisms to indigenous despotisms. Uh, and in the course of a typical year, we will hear Dr. King in the name of civil rights uh, propose that we stop the war in Vietnam, that we launch poverty programs all over the world, that we support Ben Bella and the Congo rebels, that we boycott all of Alabama and Mississippi. We will hear Dr. King announce that Senator Goldwater's candidacy for the presidency had Hitlerian overtones and that the Negro community would greet his election with violence. Even as Jackie Robinson announced in New York that violence would result in the event of my own election, which hardly meant that New York was running any considerable risk. <laughs> we see... <clears throat>
by Ed Rustin calling for the radical transformation of the present system and James Baldwin coming out for the renunciation of Christian civilization uh, and by Ed Rustin praising Malcolm X at his funeral and Leroy joined Jones beginning uh, begging his people to despise all white men and Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the most prominent Negro politician in the United States, flouting the laws and cultivating base racism. Uh, and Jesse Gray and Milton Galamison calling for bringing the city of New York to a halt. Every movement breeds, of course, its own fanatics. Uh, and it is unreasonable to suppose uh, that the Negro movement shouldn't. But it is also unreasonable to ask that these leaders should go relatively unopposed because we sub must submit uh, even to the tyranny of fanaticism uh, in order convincingly to register uh, our acquiescence that many white people are tragically remiss in their moral obligations. One of the troubles is that white people continue to condescend to Negro leaders as witness, for instance, the groveling reception given to Mr. James Baldwin's book in which he charged that Americans had no ideals. He practically confirmed his own thesis uh, because the reviewers, even in the religious journals, failed to distinguish between the protest of Mr. Baldwin, which was terrifying in its integrity and its artistry and its righteousness, and the program of Mr. Baldwin, which was terrifying in its nihilism, in its destructiveness. So in conclusion, let me say, but the Martin Luther Kings and James Baldwins need to be treated as individuals rather than merely as Negro leaders, and they must be opposed even as we oppose others when their judgments go badly awry. Mr. Louis Lomax is not always the Prince of Restraint, but I greatly respect his talent and integrity and profoundly hope that however intensely he will disagree with me on any number of issues, he will concede that I do not judge him as a Negro but as a man in many ways my equal, in many ways my superior, and that we will argue with each other as men of differing political creeds whose difference in race is gloriously and triumphantly irrelevant. <laughs> Our next speaker is Mr. Louis Lomax, and he will have an additional two minutes to speak. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Buckley, ladies and gentlemen, I rise to move the negative of the question before the House, to submit the thesis that the civil rights movement in America is indeed correct and headed in the right direction. And I shall sustain my opening argument with three points. One, the civil rights movement in America is moving correctly in that it is moving toward more federal intervention in those areas that heretofore have been deemed the provinces of the several states. Now I am pained as much as my adversary Mr. Buckley is by this, but unfortunately there is no alternative to this action. It's plainly clear, certainly not even Mr. Buckley can doubt it, that the white power structure of several of our six states have demonstrated beyond any need for argument that they are not going to grant to the Negro those rights, those dignities spelled out in our founding documents. The choice then is between federal intervention and the continuation of the political and economic excesses and human perfidies practiced by the likes of Strom Thurmond George Wallace, Tom Clark, James Eastland, and the tried and true journeymen, jurymen of Haneyville, Alabama, with a choice then between more federal intervention and justice meted out by these men, I choose federal intervention. 
My second urging is that the civil rights movement is going in the correct direction in that it will continue, if necessary, to hold mass demonstrations which conceivably could bring about the violation of provincial laws which have been designed to perpetuate the status quo. Again one is pain, again one is troubled. After all, no one really wishes to advocate the breaking of a law, regardless of how provincial it may be, in a civilized society. But again, young people, there is no alternative. The white people of Valdosta, Georgia, for example, have taken my parents' tax money and have built, say, for example, a park bench and a school. And the very men who did this then passed a law saying neither my father nor my mother nor I may sit on that bench or attend that school. Now, in that instance, Mr. Buckley, I submit, indeed you do have law, but you do not have justice, and I suggest that law without justice is tyranny, and I choose to break that law. My third urging is that the civil rights movement is headed toward the creation of more jobs for opportunities for the Negro and equally toward the readying of Negroes for, this oppor for these opportunities. This means, in a sense, that the civil rights movement is come full circle. The Urban League started out in the 19 teens with this precise self-help idea. And then we discovered that we were but having our sons and daughters educate themselves for a dead end that we were scrubbing them up to become shoeshine boys and Pullman porters. More egregious, we discovered that in the case of the National Board of the Urban League, some of the very white men who were helping us help ourselves were the very real estate brokers and businessmen most guilty of housing and job discrimination. And it was this failure, this breakdown of confidence, this crisis of confidence that brought on what I have called the Negro Revolt. Now that I have enunciated my basic three points, Allow me to review each of them in some depth, but let me do it in the, in the light of the total writings and utterances of my distinguished opponent. You see, we have listened uh, to Mr. Buckley's opening statement, and what we must admit, that he is the high poobah when it comes to the art of delivering the grand element in consequentia. But when it gets down... <laughs> But when it comes down to asking and answering the very question he himself raises, which is, what shall we do? He says nothing, but he comes up with a string of negatives, still leaving somebody hanging from a tree, dead from under an earthen dam, unable to vote, unable to eat, unable to go to school while we engage in polemics. And if you know the masses as I know the masses, they're not going to sit around while we have a debate over their freedom. Now, let us go somewhat into depth as to what I have proposed. First, this business of the civil rights movement, uh, movement going toward more federal control. All of us want and welcome a degree of federal control and federal intervention. Indeed, we are glad to have the federal government regulating the FCC, regulating the airwaves, regulating to an extent our highways and getting them built, regulating to a very great extent our air lanes to keep our planes from banging into one another. In other words, are these people who talk about they don't want the climate clause of the government into their local affairs don't mind the government coming in so long as it is something for them. But when it is something for me, then all of a sudden the spectra of statism seems to rise up and haunt the nation. And the moment that I want the federal government to come in and see to it that I can vote, that I can get a jury trial, then those who have reaped most indeed from the federal government are the first to rise and say, no, you are right in what you want, but you are wrong in how you're trying to do it. Well, now let's see if they really mean that. Let's take Mr. Buckley himself. In his book, Up From Liberalism, he argues loud and long, for example, against unionism and a certain kind of unionism. And what does he advocate to regulate unions? Federal intervention. When Mr. Buckley comes further in his book and he says if the steel maker is allowed to go on strike and stay on strike, it means in due course the hardware salesman must therefore go out of business. So what does Mr. Buckley demand to see to it 
that the union worker cannot go on strike, union intervention. In other words, for Mr. Buckley, statism is all right in the marketplace, but it's all wrong in the voting booth, and I can't understand this. And when you examine these views, it suddenly becomes very clear that Mr. Buckley indeed is not anti-Negro. He is anti-people. And his urgings always will support federal intervention so long as it has to do with institutions, with things. But when it comes to feeding the poor, helping the downtrodden, and giving the man who has been kicked and beaten and discriminated against a chance, then all of a sudden the spectra of statism enters. And I ask you this. It is said, and he said it the other night, we shall not, in thunderous tones he said, commit this nation to slavery simply because of Louis Lomax's rhetoric. But I ask you, what slavery does it bring upon you to let me eat a hamburger? How are you enslaved by allowing me to vote? How are you enslaved by allowing my child to go to school at a school paid for by my taxes? Freedom, like love, is a magnificent thing. And the more you give, the more you get. <laughs> and therefore, I submit, by allowing the Negro to get his freedom, you will not bring slavery on the white man. Indeed, you will free the white man from this terrible burden of history that Mr. Buckley has so accurately described. <laughs> Let us take my second point, that the civil rights movement is headed toward more demonstrations, and let's get onto this thing that is such a bone in the craw of the conservatives that we might break some more laws. Now let us examine this law and order thesis, because I swear to you, it is as phony as a Bay Ping peace dog. <laughs> now in reality, what we in the civil rights movement have done is this. We have broken petty provincial laws, which were put up after Reconstruction under what is now known as the infamous Black Codes. We have never challenged, we have never advocated the breaking of any of the fundamental laws of our civilization. And I go on to point out that every law we have broken has gone on to be declared unconstitutional. <laughs> and this nonsense that one hears that we advocate the mass breaking of laws, the disrespect of jurisprudence is not true. What we do say is that when a law is clearly wrong, and it is as, as petty as a law which says, here is a drinking fountain built in Mississippi with my tax money, and the water comes out of one pipe and spreads out into a Y, I think I have the right to drink from both sides of that Y if I wish, and I break that law, then I become a lawbreaker, but it goes up to the Supreme Court, and is this not the way we always move in a civilized society? Furthermore, they say you must respect the laws. Yet my distinguished adversary, Mr. Buckley, writing in the National Review, and again in his own book, when the first civil rights bill was imminent in 1957, he had a monologue with himself, which is not entirely unusual. <laughs> and what does he say in this editorial in the National Review, must the South win, must the South prevail? He asks himself, do the white people of the South, when they are in a minority, have the right to flout the constitutional mandate and deny the right of the vote to the Negro who is in the majority. And Mr. Buckley says, yes, the white minority has the right to flout the law of the Constitution and deny the vote to the majority Negroes because, quote, the white minority are the advanced race. He didn't have any qualms about suggesting breaking the law then. Why is he so squeamish about breaking the law now? And I submit that the issue involved is indeed much, indeed much, much more fundamental. What I am really suggesting
is that the civil rights movement in America is moving in the direct direction of freeing not only me, but of freeing you, of freeing this nation. It's more than my getting a house, my getting a hamburger, my going to the bathroom, my going to the polling booth. It is indeed a philosophical survival of our very way of life. For after all, I submit, the Negro revolt in America is but a minor symptom of the major shaking and trembling going on all over the world. And here we are, young people, locked in a struggle almost to the death with communism. And many of you young men, indeed most of you, shall soon be called upon, I fear, to lay your lives on the line. Now this being true, what are we trying to do? We are out to win the uncommitted people of the world. Well, I challenge you young people, go back to your classrooms, go back to your dormitory rooms, pull down the map on the wall and draw a circle around the committed people of the world and you will find that all of the white people of the world are committed. The uncommitted people of the world are the non-white people of Asia and of Africa. How can you save a man in South Vietnam unless you really love him? Or is he just another yellow slant-eyed oriental who was kept out of this country by our quota system? When you go to South Vietnam as a Peace Corps worker or as a soldier and you take him by the arm and you say, brother, come follow me, and he says, where? Let's make a world that you can tell him back home to the land of the free where all men, regardless of their color, regardless of their race, can stand in dignity and grow in power and work in majesty. And when you go into Africa and take that black man by the arm, after you explain the way why he couldn't get housing when he came to UCLA and USC, after you explain away why his diplomats were put in jail for trying to eat a hamburger on Route 40, after you explain why his delegates to the United Nations have been insulted in the nightclubs and in the restaurants of no less than New York, after all of that is done, and you say to him, black brother, follow me, and he says, where? We of the civil rights movement hope to have built a world so you can say, back home to freedom, back home to dignity, it is beyond race. It goes to the question of mankind. It goes to the question that a man is a man, and that beyond the color of his skin and the nature of his religion, there is that greater other ethic which is his humanness. And it is in that spirit that I move the adoption of the negative of the motion before the house. And I make that move in the firm faith that if you adopt the negative, you shall go one giant step toward creating the kind of society that not only will endure, but will, will prevail.